My name is Annie Hockett and I'm here today to talk to you on behalf of Prevent Child Abuse Tuolumne County, or PCATC for short. Uh, PCATC is Tuolumne County's local Child Abuse Prevention Council and our council in the last two years have developed some curriculum around the topic of trauma and trauma-informed care and that is what I'm going to be speaking to you guys today about. So when we talk about trauma, it's helpful to have a definition of what we mean. Essentially, trauma is any event or series of events that can be overwhelming to a person's sense of physical or emotional safety. What's important to remember is that what can be traumatic to one person is not necessarily traumatic to somebody else. There are obvious uh, categories of trauma that we see. Um, any form of child abuse would be classified as a tra traumatic event. So cases of sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and all forms of neglect can be traumatic. There can also be situations that might not seem obviously traumatic to a child, such as divorce, maybe involvement in a motor vehicle accident, potentially a medical procedure that one has to undergo and of course natural disaster. So when we say trauma-informed care, that's another topic that is helpful to have a definition of. And really what we're talking about there is that every person, every system, every service provider that comes in contact with a child that's been exposed to trauma is aware of what trauma might look like and is sensitive to the unique trauma needs that that child might have. The official definition I'll read for you. Trauma-informed care is an approach to engaging people with histories of trauma that recognize the presence of trauma symptoms and acknowledges the role that trauma has played in their lives. When we're talking about trauma-informed care, what's important to kind of remember is that it really requires a paradigm shift for all of us. If we can shift our focus and be sensitive to what trauma might look like in those that we work with, the world is going to look very different. One way that I like to think about this is if we change the question to what is wrong with that person or what is wrong with that child, and we flip it and instead ask ourselves, what has happened to that person or what has happened to that child? That will allow us to see things very differently. Okay, I'm going to go slide four. Okay, I think at this point we might try a angle change. Okay. Let's try to, because we'll see, let's see what, let's see what else we can come up with here. Where we won't. All right, something a little different. All right, what do you guys think? Just don't get the corner there. <laughs> get that. There you go. There you go. Good. All right, let's try that. Okay, so slide four. You know, when we go out into the community and we talk about this topic, we often encounter what we call kind of trauma myths or belief systems about this topic that we like to dispel kind of right away. One of them that we hear often is that trauma can be relatively short term. And really what we know from the research and the science behind this is that this can have lasting effects on the child throughout their life. We also hear, well, children just naturally can outgrow it. What we also know is that if a child has been exposed to some significant trauma, that they do oftentimes require interventions, whether that be from a professional organization or just the community. We also hear that to experience trauma, it has to happen right after the event. That can certainly be the case, but there can also be cases of uh, exposure that we, we hear that trauma can be relatively um, with a quick onset, and that certainly can be the case, but what we also know is that there can be a delayed onset in symptoms. We often hear that trauma cannot affect very young children, and actually the absolute opposite is true, that trauma can be most devastating to young children. We hear that uh, one has to be kind of immediately exposed to a tra traumatic event in order to have a response. We also know that just by hearing about it, by seeing it on the television, by the, the newscast, that that can also have an impact on children. When we go out and we speak about this topic to, to groups, we often come across kind of myths or um, misconceptions about the topic that we like to dispel kind of right away. So I'm going to go through a couple of those. One, trauma can be relatively short term. 
that's typically not the case. It typically can have a lifelong impact if not treated effectively. Here, well, children can just naturally grow out of that. Again, oftentimes it requires kind of professional intervention to really be able to help a child overcome a traumatic experience hear that trauma response has to begin right away. Um, we know that that can sometimes be true, but there, there can also be a delayed onset in symptoms. What we hear very commonly is that trauma cannot affect young children. We know that this is absolutely untrue and that the effects of trauma are most devastating to young children, including children in utero. We often are told, oh well, you know, a child has to be present to really experience a traumatic response. We know also that that is not true, that just by certainly hearing about something um, can also be a very traumatic experience for a young child. Less common, but we still hear it, is that there's not a link between substance abuse and trauma in children. We know through research that that is not true and that there's a strong correlation to a family substance abuse and trauma symptoms in a child. Okay, so when we talk about trauma, sometimes it's helpful to have some kind of point of reference in terms of how common it really is. So I'm going to share a few stats with you. It's estimated that approximately 34% of children in the United States will have experienced at least one traumatic. 75 to 93% of children in the juvenile justice system come with trauma history. We also know that the likelihood of an uh, adult inmate in a... It's helpful to have a point of reference. Um, Terms of how prevalent trauma can be in our community and nationwide. So I'm going to share a few statistics with you. It's estimated that approximately 34% of children in the U.S. will have experienced at least one traumatic experience. 75 to 93% of children entering the juvenile justice system come with a trauma history. It's estimated that approximately 70% of adult inmates that are incarcerated were at one time in foster care, thus linking trauma histories to adult incarceration. It's also estimated that approximately 25% of children before the age of four will experience a trauma. I'm going to take a minute to think about maybe a child you've worked with, a child you've known in your neighborhood or your community that has maybe exhibited challenging behaviors. So take a minute, think of that child, and think about what behaviors you actually saw. So some that might come to mind include kind of agitation, anger, depression, withdrawal, aggression. You kind of name it in a child that has some difficult behaviors and you can link that back to a trauma response. A lot um, of our understanding of trauma comes with new kind of technologies and breakthroughs in brain science. And we can actually kind of look at a child's brain that has been through a traumatic experience and see the changes that can occur. What's important to remember is that if trauma is exposed at a very early age, the child's brain actually kind of develops in a disorganized way. So if we have a caregiver that's responsive to a child um, in those early years, that brain develops. If we have an unresponsive caregiver or an abusive caregiver, that brain develops develops in a very disorganized way. What's important to know, again, is that for a child with a trauma history, their brain literally kind of responds differently than a normal healthy brain. Normal brain, when we have a threat, um, the brain kind of sends signals simultaneously, or I'm going to do this again, sorry, is that um, the traumatized brain literally responds differently. Normal brain, when a threat is perceived, signals are sent simultaneously to multiple sections of the brain, the higher and lower sections. Um, the higher area of the brain is able to really kind of do some processing of that and determine this isn't actually threatening. When you have a traumatized brain, that signal is only one way and it tells the body, you are threatened, you better focus on survival. Another helpful way to kind of think of this is that try to imagine reasoning with a lizard. And I know that sounds funny, but a lizard lacks the part of the human brain that's able to kind of modulate their emotions and think critically. It's the same kind of way that a traumatized brain works. So if you try to imagine reasoning with a lizard or reasoning with a person that's been exposed to trauma and that are dysregulated, you're going to get the same results. So thinking back to that list of behaviors that I had you think of in terms of challenging behaviors of a kid that you might work with, you can really kind of classify it into three categories. Hypersensitive, hypervigilant, or tuned out and shut down. And really, if we look at those three categories, it's all a form of dysregulation. And so when we really are talking about trauma and symptoms, we're talking about a child that's dysregulated.
difficult as that can be, if we can step back and understand that that's a very natural response to experiencing trauma, it can make it a little bit easier to work with that youth. So kind of on that topic of dysregulation, you can kind of imagine um, what that might look like in a normal, healthy kind of human. Um, and you can see on the slide here that that kind of ebbs and flows in a really natural direction. This is what it looks like when that person is dysregulated or that person has kind of organized their brain around trauma and chaos. So you can notice it's quite different. To kind of sum up some of the key points of everything that I've been talking about, I want to remind you guys all that trauma victims literally perceive the world differently and they view non-threatening situations as potentially dangerous. And if we can think about these behaviors as being a very natural response, a stress response to the circumstances of their environment, it makes a lot of sense. And what happens to the brain when under intense stress or traumatized is that the brain cannot use all its capacity, therefore the ability to kind of think critically, to use logic, um, all of those higher functions kind of go out the window be difficult about this topic is that uh, you can kind of walk away feeling kind of hopeless that um, once the damage is done there's nothing that can be done to kind of help a child or a, an adult. Um, I'll tell you that that's not true. There is hope and I'll talk about kind of what that looks like. I'll talk to you a little bit today about the ACEs study and the ACEs study is kind of a landmark study that um, has really kind of changed the game for this topic. It was back in kind of the mid 90s and researchers kind of just stumbled upon this. The, the background is a doctor at a Kaiser in San Diego was operating a weight loss clinic. And as he was working with patients, he kind of discovered, gosh, all of these patients have kind of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. So he partnered with the CDC and they kind of ran with this and was able to kind of pair patients with issues I was doing good too that first part. <laughs> you can just pick up. Can I pick there? Up. Okay. Just gotta just gotta go a couple sentences ahead and we'll yeah. piece it together. Okay. Research was done out of Kaiser, um, and they kind of stumbled upon the findings. Initially, there was a physician that was operating a weight loss clinic and determined that a lot of the patients he was working with had adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. So he partnered with the CDC, and essentially what they did is they looked at adverse childhood experiences and later health outcomes, and they were kind of floored with what they found. What they determined is that the more adverse childhood experiences one had in their past, the poorer health outcomes they had. They were able to link adverse childhood experiences with all sorts of public health concerns, smoking, substance abuse, suicide, mental health issues, depression, heart disease, COPD, and cancer. They also were able to determine that the more ACEs one had, the poorer the outcomes. Um, estimate that there's a 20 year reduction in one's life with an ACE score of six or above. I encourage you to kind of look more into this research. It's all over. Should I have brought wardrobe changes? <laughs>